Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Michael. Uh, so I will just uh, kick off the uh, the webinar. Thank you all for being here. Um, so first of all, I would like to take the opportunity and then just give you guys a uh, update about uh, our current situation. Can uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're right. good now. Okay, yes. cool. Uh, so just a little update about uh, SLG and uh, our factories in China. Uh, I'm sure some of you guys are kind of curious. So uh, very fortunate, uh, the city we are located, Stafford, Texas, is uh, currently under very minimum impact. Uh, we don't have a lot of cases, uh, confirmed cases so, uh, down here. So uh, we are able to maintain a uh, normal uh, daily operation for both uh, office and warehouse. Uh, so our staff is uh, fully available uh, to, for calls and emails and my warehouse, both on the modification slash assembling area and also shipping our uh, remains a uh, standard normal operation. Uh, about as for our factories, so things are actually moving a lot better than we expected. Uh, our production is back online uh, for a while now, and uh, we're expecting things gonna be at a, its full capacity in a short period of time. Uh, now we do have a few challenges and um, I hope you guys can uh, understand and share with our customer to make sure they know what exactly is going on. Uh, the first challenge will be uh, a um, transportation for the employees. Now, as you all know, a uh, uh, majority of employees, actually, they're not from the city uh, where our factories are. Uh, they're actually from the different province or you know states. So uh, even the quarantine policies starting getting revoked at the majority of the cities, but uh, transportation is still difficult uh, due to the fact that they just a large population. Um, so uh, I've been told that our management over there are doing whatever they can to, to make some arrangements for the employees who want to come back to work. Uh, so we're getting that sorted out uh, gradually. The uh, other challenge, uh, challenge will be uh, uh, the shipping. Now, as you all know, we do a lot of modification assembling in Houston. Uh, a lot of times when we have some items that are out of stock, instead of waiting for a ocean shipping, which can take four to six weeks uh, of the transportation time, uh, we, do, uh, we actually usually do uh, air shipping for some smaller things like the modules or the drivers uh, to Houston, and then we swap them uh, to shorten the lead time for the customers. Now, air shipping currently is, uh, is having a, uh, is, is a big challenge because simply, um, if you all know a little bit about uh, uh, logistics, you will know that majority of the cargo is actually moved uh, with these passenger flights. It's not a cargo flight that takes the uh, uh, the, the capacity is actually the passenger flight. Now, because all these major airlines, they cancel or they reduce in the frequency of the flights, uh, the space is very min uh, limited and the cost is extremely high at this point. So that's the, one of the difficulties that we need to work it out. So you will see some items are having a little bit longer lead time than uh, normal, but they are, uh, Thanks to the hard work of our purchasing department, uh, we actually went a little overkill uh, before our factory closed. We moved a lot of products prior to that to Houston. So as a matter of fact, uh, the current inventory level at SLG remains very strong. Uh, it's not a lot of uh, products that are out of stock. And then we have a, we're starting to have a steady uh, inventory come in to fill up the gaps. So, uh, not really, nothing need to be really worried about at this point. Uh, so we, we're good so far and the things uh, changed. Uh, we will have you guys updated on the situation. 
Um, so that's just a little update uh, for you guys. And um, please do share the information to the customers who distribute a contract and make sure they understand what exactly is going on. So, um, and uh, we're gonna basically talk about our control solution today. Uh, we're gonna start with our uh, Synapse control solution. Uh, Bo Wells, who is our IT manager, is gonna walk you guys through some of the details. Uh, and um, uh, Bo, are you Hi, Bo. online? Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, this is Bo. I'm the IT manager at SLG Lighting, but I do a little bit of everything that deals with technology. Uh, and I've been working with this Synapse Control and some other control systems for quite a while now. So uh, they asked me to give a brief presentation. Uh, we're going to show a little video and most of it's going to be, uh, you know, fast forward throughout the video. So if anybody wants to see the full video afterwards or uh, has any technical questions, uh, just let us know and we'll forward the uh, uh, video to you uh, or I'll try and answer your questions here. Uh, what the Synapse, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, control system is, is a gateway that allows you to connect to modules that are installed in the lights or modules that connect to non-LED lights. Uh, and it can connect to some other equipment like power, HVAC, things like that. So you can control everything from a central location. Uh, the gateway is the SS450 that you see up at the top. It has a built-in network uh, that is similar to the Wi-Fi that you have on your phone or laptop that uh, connects the gateway to a few devices. And then those devices connect to the, uh, the next level of devices and so on and so on. And so it spreads out into what's called a mesh network over a very wide distance. They suggest that distance not be more than one mile and that you currently, uh, you can't have more than 1000 devices. Uh, but that's a pretty large distance and a pretty high number of devices to be able to control through one of these controllers. Uh, in addition to that network, uh, uh, there is a standard Wi-Fi network. So if you're going to be in a customer location where they don't have any kind of network whatsoever, but they want to be able to talk to the controller, it has a built-in Wi-Fi access point that you can use to connect to it. You can disable that if you have security concerns. Uh, there's also a standard Ethernet network port on the side. So if they do have an existing network, they can plug that right in uh, and communicate it to it the way that they, they would any other device on their network. Additionally, there are two cellular network antennas uh, for connecting the device to the Verizon network. So if you're going to have a remote office that uh, doesn't have a reliable internet connection or uh, you want to be able to connect this to the cloud so you can control it from anywhere easily, then you can get a uh, SIM card for Verizon, pop that in there, and you can then access it from anywhere in the world uh, as long as you have paid for their cloud subscription to the software. Uh, there are other ways to access it remotely and we can work with you on that. Uh, but the standard method is uh, uh, for remote access is to use the cellular network connection or an internet connection through their subscription cloud service. Now this gateway connects to controllers that are inside the lights or as I mentioned, external uh, like the DIM 10 250-11 there on the bottom. These devices have uh, connections for other sensors like motion sensors, <clears throat> the uh, photo cells. Uh, it has a uh, built-in uh, uh, 2.4 gigahertz connection so it can talk to that uh, site controller. Uh, it has other electronic uh, components in there for monitoring various things. If the power supply that you have is Dolly 2 compatible, it can do things like monitor the temperature, monitor the power throughput, uh, a lot of little features. We are going to be installing those modules here uh, on any fixtures that get purchased with the device. Uh, and we'll add the uh, 2.4 gigahertz antenna There'll be nothing that the customer needs to do other than just install it. Uh, the twist lock uh, photo cell uh, uh, that you see there is just a standard NEMA uh, twist lock, but it has that controller built into it. So if you have something like an area light 
that uh, you uh, previously purchased from us and you want to add this to it, you can just pop that on there and you'll be able to add this Synapse wireless network to it. The bottom one is for if you have some components that for some reason you can't use one of the embedded controllers or the twist lock controller, we don't expect there's a lot of need for this, but they do have it. If you have some old uh, lights that are non-LED that you want to connect to the network, or you have a bunch of uh, landscaping lights that just aren't big enough for this, you can use that as the power source for those lights. So the power passes through it and it can control things like dimming and everything there. It can also be directly attached to sensors. So if you wanted to put a motion sensor at the entryway to your parking lot, but you don't have a light there, you could put that in a pole or some kind of device with a sensor there, and it would be able to send back that sensor information to the gateway. Um, you wanna go ahead and go to the next one? Yeah, so uh, uh, like I said- How far can that, re that hardware, uh, your bolt-on connector, how far can that be placed from a fixture if it had to be remote? Uh, I honestly have not had that question before, but coming out of that bolt-on is just a, uh, a standard electrical you know, uh, cable. So it replaces, it can connect to a power supply or it can power up to five amps uh, worth of lights. So uh, basically you have AC going into it and then you have the DC coming out of it. Uh, and then it has a little uh, connectors for, you wanna go ahead to that next slide. Do we have the slide for that? Mm -hmm. uh, he's asking about the uh, bolt on. Yeah, we do. Yeah, let's just pop over to that. Yeah, so uh, if you see those little uh, uh, connectors on there, uh, the ones on the upper left, those are your connections to your uh, your power source. There is a little screw on the side for uh, the ground. Beneath that is your connection that goes out to an additional power uh, supply. On the bottom right, those are your connections to things like sensors, uh, photo cell, motion sensor, and then the little uh, brass colored screw. That's where you put the uh, antenna for its connection back to the rest of the network. That can be you know, a long distance from uh, the uh, gateway, but it needs to be within 800 to 1,000 feet of either the gateway or another uh, light that's on the current mesh network because it's using 2.4 gigahertz signal and that's kind of the limit on, on where that's gonna go with the antennas that are in these because of uh, FCC restrictions on the power of that antenna. But uh, the power coming out of that to supply lights, uh, I can't imagine it, you know, there being any problem connecting something that's 20 to 50 feet away. It's just a standard power cable. Right on, thank you. Right. Um, yeah, you wanna go back to yeah. the other one? Um, or the, 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 uh, the first one, not the one before that. Oh. Yeah, so um, this right here is designed to be mounted inside of an office. They do have an external one. If you're gonna put these like at a uh, sports arena or something and they're gonna have it in a box outside, there is a uh, outdoor version of it that comes in an IP65 sealed box. That box also comes with a uh, five plug uh, USB connector that's built into uh, uh, the, I guess the, the shelter there. So they can do things like assign a scene to a button. So push button one, it turns all the lights off push the button two, it turns these lights on and, and those lights down to 50% 50, 50 or whatever you want it to do. Uh, but essentially they're the exact same. The only difference is the outdoor uh, version is in a IP65 box and it has the buttons. <clears throat> um, I guess let's go ahead and go to the next one. So this is the module that we put inside of the light fixtures. Uh, it is maybe an uh, inch and a half by inch and a half, uh, very small. Uh, the little connectors there on the bottom are just for their testing, but that has a small 2.4 gigahertz antenna that's built into it. If the fixture that we're putting it in uh, is in a plastic housing, well, then you don't need an additional antenna. But if it's in a metal housing, well, that metal housing will block that uh, radio signal. So there are two small uh, dots there uh, above that uh, silver gray square. That's where we connect a standard 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi antenna. And then we poke that antenna, a little stubby 2.4 gigahertz antenna that's about half an inch uh, long, or we can put uh, a larger one. 
and that goes on the outside of the fixture. It'll be a watertight uh, a seal there, so uh, won't break the uh, IP65 integrity of any outdoor lights or anything like that. Uh, this right here, whenever we install it, if you're picking uh, things like motion detectors or things like that, uh, we'll go ahead and make the connection on those when we ship it. Um, there are a lot of things that this can do, I said, but uh, we're just kind of covering the basics on it. So if anybody has any questions about this, please speak up. Uh, on to the next one. So like I said before, this is exactly the same as the one that I just showed, but this is designed to go on the little NEMA twist lock connector on top of the area lights. It has the same module that was on the previous slide inside of it. It also has a small photo cell and uh, that just connects to the standard, uh, I believe it's a seven pin uh, twist lock connection there. So you can connect other things like motion sensors and things to it through those uh, 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 connectors on the NEMA twist lock. Uh, no other extra capabilities other than it has the photo cell built into that. Uh, this, as I said, is the external one. Uh, this is really meant for lights for some reason that you can't put one of those modules on or you have some old style lights and you wanna be able to power those. Uh, or if you have some area where you're not gonna have a light, but you want a motion sensor, you can connect that motion sensor directly to the network without needing a light uh, with this device. Uh, we don't know if there's a big need for this or not. Uh, we're probably not gonna be stocking many of those here, uh, but we can get them fairly quickly. Uh, okay, so we've got a, just a quick video here, uh, uh, maybe five minutes, where we're gonna go through some of the basic setup and features of it. I'm not gonna get too detailed. I just wanna kind of give you an idea uh, of, of what the customer's gonna see on their end. If we actually, if you sell one of these to a customer, the plan is that we're gonna come out, set up the uh, gateway, do a quick training for the customer, help them set up any of the scenes or any of the behaviors that they want and then support it uh, going forward, or you know, they can go through you and you can go through us. You can always uh, pay for the support through Synapse, but uh, I think we're, we're gonna try and keep the price down by uh, doing that for you with, for a reasonable amount of support. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So all of the uh, connections to the gateway are through a standard web browser. Any web browser that you've got should be able to connect to it. Whenever we first install it, we do a very brief setup. We set the time zone. Uh, we're gonna set the standard ethernet network connections. Uh, uh, we're gonna go ahead and configure buttons if there are buttons built into the system, such as the external device, or if you purchased one of the button packages. Um, the Wi-Fi that is built into it, it's enabled. The uh, standard access point uh, configuration is on uh, uh, a sticker on the side of the device. Uh, it's not like a lot of these uh, cheap network products where the default username and password are just admin, admin, or admin password. Uh, but it is, it, it is something that can be easily hacked, I guess. So we encourage people to go ahead and change that username and password. That way nobody can get into it or uh, go ahead and just turn off the Wi-Fi connection altogether if you don't feel that you have a need for that. Um, the ethernet settings are if you have an existing ethernet network, uh, you go ahead and configure that by default. It's just like any other device, you plug it into your network, it should get an IP address from whatever your, your network uh, 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 router or DHCP server is. Um, and once you've done that, you're done. It's a very, very simple initial setup. So. Um, what we're going to go ahead and go through here is just a quick overview of how they would add lights, how they would create zones and scenes. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and go through. So there are three different ways that you can add lights. The most basic is what's called a census. You simply tell it to go look for new devices on the network. It tries to scan the network, uh, see what it can find, if anything it doesn't recognize it will go ahead and pull up. Let's see where we are. One second, let me just check if any of my microphone works. Was that music from you or was that music from somebody? Yeah. Well, that's what we don't have anymore, so. yeah. uh, Okay, can you go back to uh, yes. where you were just a second ago yes. on the video? Yes. Uh, 
it was adding the, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead and just hit there mm -hmm. and hit pause as soon as it comes up after it's done with that. Mm -hmm. All right, hit pause. So whenever mm -hmm. it finds a device, you're going to be able to give that device a descriptive name. If you don't give it a name, it's just going to call it light and the code that is on the side of each of the uh, uh, modules. Um, the descriptive names, you know, parking lot, light three, you know, things like that. If it, you have sensors that are attached to that light, you would check these boxes and you would configure those now. And you could also configure standard behaviors at this point. Generally, we don't suggest you do that. We just say you want to create a scene and use the scenes for all your behaviors, but you can do all of it at once whenever you're adding a light. This is the standard way that you would add a small number of lights is just hit the census, let it find the lights, give the light a name, and you're done. Uh, go ahead and hit play. Uh, once you have added that light, it'll show up just like any other light in one of the standard zones that you have. Uh, I guess let that finish. Um, the, the standard zones are right there, zone one, two, three, and all. All is just all the lights that are currently in the system. You can edit the configuration of a light from there, rename it, uh, set up those sensors if you forgot to, set up behaviors and things like that. Also, some of these lights, uh, say you got a parking lot light that is uh, 50,000 lumens and you think that's a little too much. You can go ahead and click that advanced options and one of the options there is to set a maximum uh, uh, wattage that you want that light to be at every time that it comes on. So maybe you, you whenever you say 100%, you really mean 80%. So you go ahead and set that maximum there. Uh, is it still going? Yeah. Um, uh, once, you're, once you've done that, the light is in the system, you can control it just like any other light. Um, there are two other ways to uh, add a light. Uh, is this the... Oh, this is just adding the... the okay, yeah, so that's the... Uh, a little bit. Um, the, the one is that you can manually add it, where you just, instead of doing the census, you already know the code, you already know the all the information that uh, you want. Uh, uh, um, uh, and another is, if you're going to be adding a lot of lights, you don't want to spend all week typing this information in. So if you already have one of these gateways at your location and uh, the customer is going to buy, uh, you know, let's just say 100 lights and they're going to want to add these to uh, their system, we would ask them to click that export button and send us that file. We would then go in and add all that information to that uh, Excel file, send it back to them. Once the lights arrive at their location, they click import, they uh, import that file, they're done. Uh, nothing else to do to get the lights in the system. Uh, things like uh, changing the uh, uh, zones and behaviors and scenes, we can also do that, but that's a little more difficult. It might be easier uh, for small changes that we just remote in and do it for them. But importing lights, it's very simple uh, using one of those three methods. Uh, go ahead. Uh, you can see there that that is the code that is on every light. Every light or module comes with two of those stickers. They usually say, uh, put one on the uh, uh, device itself and put one on the pole or something like that so you can find it at a later time. Uh, but uh, that's the code that the system uses to identify it on the network. Uh, every light is gonna be put in a zone. It can be in more than one zone, but uh, it's gonna at least be put into the all zone. A zone is just a way of taking an action on several lights at once. So you would call your parking lot a uh, zone, and that would be all the lights in your parking lot. Uh, if you have a uh, warehouse one, you'd create a zone called warehouse one, and then you can turn them all off or turn them all on at the same time by taking an action on the entire zone. Uh, very simple to create a zone. You just click that add a zone button, give it a name, pick which lights you want in there, and you're done. Once you have a zone, then you want to create a scene. A scene is something like uh, you leave at the end of the day and you want all of the parking lot lights to be at 75%. You want the lights inside the building to be at zero, but to turn on if they detect motion. 
and you want the lights in the warehouse to be at 1%. Uh, that is several different uh, uh, configurations that are called behaviors that you want to happen at the same time. So that is what's called a scene. So you create your scenes uh, for whatever you want to happen. And then you can assign those scenes to a schedule or a button, a uh, button on the wall in the office, a button uh, that's directly connected to the uh, gateway uh, or something that just kicks off at a certain time of day. Very simple to create these scenes, but some of them can get pretty complicated once you start adding 50 different sensors and 50 different things that you want to, uh, to happen. Uh, we'll probably have to be involved with them if they want to cancel or create anything simple. I mean, creating anything complex. Uh, to add a schedule, it's just like adding anything to an Outlook uh, meeting. You're going to give it a name, you're going to give it a time, you pick which scene you want to happen, and you schedule it. So in this instance, we already created a parking lot scene where end of the day, the parking lot lights turn on uh, or I'm sorry, turn on at 75% and the office lights go to 0%. So we're saying every day at 6 p.m., we want that scene to happen automatically. So you schedule that and uh, one or more scenes can be scheduled for specific times. You can schedule it for multiple days or a uh, one-time event and they'll show up on that calendar there. Very, very simple to configure this thing uh, for almost everything they wanna do. Uh, but we can do complex configurations. Uh, it's a very capable system. Um, that's really about all I have to say uh, about the system. If you have any more questions, or if you want to see that full video, uh, uh, not fast forwarded, but in regular time, let me know. Uh, and I'll do what I can to answer your questions, or I'll get you a copy of that video. Mm -hmm. So, Bo, we do actually have one uh, question. Sure. So, one question is, are the Wi-Fi radios and the fixtures pre-associated with the SSID of the gateway before shipping? If not, how does a census pick them up if they are, if they are not already joined to the Wi-Fi network? So, they are not on a Wi-Fi network. The devices don't use, the gateway has a Wi-Fi network, but it has its own network that uses 2.4 gigahertz. It is not Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi is a very specific type of technology. The, uh, the communication method it's using to communicate from the gateway to the lights is similar to Wi-Fi, but it's not exactly the same. So whenever it's scanning the network, it is not scanning over a Wi-Fi uh, SSID or anything. It is trying to find any light that is within its reach uh, that uh, uh, is, is telling the rest of the network that it's unconfigured. So whenever you brought a new light into an existing network and you plug it in, within a minute, it's going to have made connections to the other lights around it saying, I'm unconfigured, I'm unconfigured, I'm unconfigured. And those are going to pass that signal up to the gateway. So whenever you click that census, it already knows that there's a new device out there. It then tries to make a communication with it and once it can make a communication with it, then it allows you to add it. Uh, if you're in one of those rare situations where your neighbor's using a SNAPS network and you're also using a SNAPS network and you both happen to do that census at the same time, well, your device might end up being configured on their network and we can fix that. But 99.999% uh, of the time, uh, that's not gonna happen. So you're gonna install a new light plug it in, wait a minute, hit the census, and you'll see the light. But it is not on a Wi-Fi network. Mm -hmm. Another question is, if you are going to pay a visit and set it up, is there a fee associated with this cost, with us uh, setting it up? I believe that there will be some fee, uh, but I do not know exactly what the fee is. It's probably going to be at least our expenses of getting there, uh, hotel, something like that. But uh, Michael will uh, have more details for you. Uh, but I do know what the fee is if Synapse comes out and does it, and ours will be a lot less than that. Mm -hmm. uh, our plan is that uh, we want to work with uh, uh, the rep or the local distributor, uh, uh, come out there and train both them and the customer at the same time. And then maybe in the future, you won't need us for the install. But if you want us for the install, that we can be there. Uh, we want to be able to provide the support, uh, but make sure that the customer is knows that they're getting the support through whoever it is that sold them the device. Uh, we'd rather 
do it that way than just hand them off to Synapse. And yes, we will provide a copy of this PowerPoint to send out to everyone at the end. And we're also going to upload the control videos, but obviously a slower version with more instructions uh, on our YouTube channel. Okay, if there's no more questions, then Chloe is gonna go ahead and configure. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Michael, he is going to do a uh, presentation on our Bluetooth control system. Uh, right. So uh, just to add on the uh, few questions that I've been hearing. So uh, number one, uh, regarding the support that uh, for uh, setting up the system after a purchase, uh, typically I think the route that we want to go with is that if you have a small job, that just a few fixtures, this is easy enough for them to figure it out just by a remote support thing. Uh, we can do a short training with the videos so that they would be able to figure it out uh, the way that they want to set up because setting up a small job site is fairly easy uh, with this user friendly uh, interface thing that uh, Bo just showed you guys. Uh, with a larger jobs, we're talking about hundreds of fixtures, like a large uh, dealership with uh, maybe three to 400 fixtures. We, we actually did that before, uh, obviously without a control, but uh, if they're uh, having problems because it is getting more and more complicated if you have more fixtures in different zones and different scenes and all that stuff, um, uh, typically you wanna talk to us and uh, I'm sure we can clear some schedule and uh, just physically be there uh, with you guys to go over the uh, setting up process. So uh, it's not necessary to have a fee for that. It's based more like a case, uh, case by case basis. Uh, so we can all talk about it down the road. So, um, and this kind of actually bring to the next point. So whenever you have a opportunity for these control system, please do reach out to us. Uh, we would like to work it with you uh, from the beginning to understand the entire project. Now it is also available uh, as a, a, a blueprint thing so that they have actually a math thing that can locate lights. So it's more visually that they can look at how these things gonna set up instead of just uh, a bunch of uh, drop col columns and stuff that they, they need to click. So it's gonna be easier than you, ex you think and uh, like I said, for small jobs, it should be fairly easy for them to say that. Um, also on the- uh, uh, You had two other questions. Can I just cover that real quick? Uh, sure, go ahead. So, all right, mm -hmm. Troy Jennings uh, had a question about uh, whether uh, we could set up a scenario where the lights are on for, during normal business hours and then at 10 p.m. automatically dim, dim the lights to 40%. If there's motion detected, bring it up to 100%. And then 30 minutes after that, there's been no motion detected to drop it back to 40%. That is absolutely possible. Uh, on the slowed down version of the video, whenever I set up a scenario, that's actually covered on there. Uh, the lights are set to a certain level. And then if motion's detected, it's brought to one level. And then after a certain amount of time that you configure, it drops to another level or it goes back to the original. Uh, I think the other question that someone had was about, is the network self-healing? Yes, so this network spreads out from light to light to light. Each of these tries to make connections to multiple lights. So if light A uh, is connected to the gateway and light B normally connects through light A to the gateway, but if for some reason, uh, somebody runs into a light pole and well, light A is no longer on the network, light B will now start trying to connect to other lights to reestablish that network automatically. And uh, each of the lights is continuously trying to see how long it takes to communicate with their neighbors and with the gateway to find out what the quickest pathway is to get back to the gateway. All right, Michael Heat. All right, cool. Uh, so if, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have another section after the the Bluetooth thing, uh, and then we can come back and uh, kind of give you guys a um, sort of 
uh, overview about each systems and what's the features and benefits between different systems and what is the solution that you should go with on some simple cases. Uh, so Kilton is our uh, Bluetooth indoor mesh networking solution that we offer. Uh, now this thing uh, basically is a Bluetooth mesh network base. Uh, it started with this thing we call the power pack. I uh, see on the uh, top right hand side. This is the power pad that connects to each fixtures, no matter you have a truffer, a panel, strip light, or a uh, highway, uh, anything indoor, uh, the thing will be work, uh, it can be uh, um, installed, pre, uh, actually pre-installed here at, in Houston. So uh, similar to the Synapse system, there's not nothing that need to be done uh, in terms of the wiring at the job site. So uh, the power pad is basically like the uh, control modules that we've been talking about. So these things talk to each other, uh, form a mesh network. Uh, it, in, it enhance the, uh, the strength of the signal, right? It increase the distance between the fixtures um, so that we can achieve a decent amount of um, uh, coverage show as a, uh, a coverage for a larger warehouse job than when they want to have a control system set it up. Now, the other accessory is that uh, we do offer a motion sensor that go with our uh, Bluetooth control network. Uh, we have actually two types of a control, a more type, more like a low bay type control, which is the small one that's more like a button uh, motion sensor on the right hand side. Now this one is having a lower mounting high max uh, at a 20 feet, a obviously smaller uh, coverage uh, for motion detections. Uh, the good thing about this one is it's very cheap, very affordable at the price point. And then if you have a drop ceiling office space that you wanna do motion sensor, uh, instead of drill holes on panels, which is not exactly the way to go, uh, this thing can, you can drill a little hole on these ceiling panels and then just have the, the sensors installed on the ceiling panel on the corners or stuff like that. So it's low profile, they won't even notice that. Uh, so it provides a nice solution for drop ceiling for office space or classrooms. Uh, the other sensor we offer is a larger one. Uh, this one is both PRI sensor and daylight harvesting integrated. Um, so this is why I actually call it a uh, directional motion detection. So if you look at it, it has little uh, pieces of covers on the uh, detect uh, the motion sensor lens. So that little cover is a, a four piece uh, setup so that you can actually remove some of the pieces or put some pieces on it to kind of cover the side that you don't want to have uh, motion to be detected. Now this is actually a nice way to uh, set it up in a warehouse when you have racks. So if between, if for the aisles, you wanted to have a side cover that so that it not detect weird stuff on the racks or kind of just a, a, a spot that you don't want to have a motion detection, All right? So um, the whole system is a um, phone slash tablet based control, right? So you have a, we, ha we have a uh, app that you can download to your phone and tablets, both uh, iPhone and Android, uh, so that uh, this is, uh, can be totally controlled wirelessly. Now, if people prefer the uh, switch thing, we do offer a wall switch, uh, also Bluetooth, it runs on bottom uh, batteries. Uh, this thing has almost full controls of the system, however, this thing cannot set it up the entire system. You have to set it up uh, using a phone or tablet, and then you can add these wall switches to the, uh, to the setup that you can have a full control of the uh, groups or scenes that you uh, previously set up on your phones and tablet. Uh, can we go to the next page, please? Mm -hmm. So, Basically, the um, so if you look at it here, we have actually two types of power pad. One is the simple, the, the basic offer on uh, the power pad. This one is just for a uh, con basic control. Now, 
a lot of people they actually needs uh, for CCT adjustable, uh, kind of what they call it tunable white technology. We do offer that. So the power pad on the right hand side is a CCT tunable uh, feature uh, power pad that can work with our CCT uh, adjustable fixtures. But typically uh, the first one is what we offer and that usually does the job. Um, so the distance of it, this is being a, a Bluetooth uh, based networking. Uh, so the distance is not going to be like the um, Synapse control. This is only going to be a max at 100 feet. Now, if you have metal sheet, sheeting walls and stuff like that between fixtures, it will uh, impact the distance of the uh, of the, 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 the network. So it might not be at 100 feet max. But the cool thing about this mesh network is like similar to the uh, Synapse control, it forms a mesh so that if a fixture is uh, having problem to catch a strong signal from other fixtures, uh, from B fixtures, uh, it will actually start searching and then trying to uh, gather signals from maybe C or D fixture to kind of enhance the overall strength of the signal. Now the maximum fixtures that we can group is a, a, a very nice decent uh, numbers. Uh, so typically this will cover majority of the application, even with super large warehouses uh, for multiple, uh, like few hundred high base. So a, this is a very nice solution for small or large jobs when they run into a indoor control solution. <clears throat> uh, can we go to the next page? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna talk about how this thing's set up and how uh, the, the thing works through the video. Uh, can you please uh, play, play the video, please? So basically, when you have a fixture, you hooked up with the uh, uh, the power pad, right? And then if it's, it's on power, uh, download the app, the Kilton app, and it will search the power pad automatically. It's almost like find your iPhone. Now, once it's searched and you can start adding the fixtures, uh, to this master group, or what I actually like to call a master group. This is all the fixtures that you currently have that is online at your facility. Now, after this step, uh, you can either control them individually, uh, if you don't want to form any group, but uh, majority of the time, I think a customer would love to uh, kind of set up a groups thing. So, um, after you add every fixture to the master group, uh, they, they can kind of set it up individually and then they can group them. So this is a individual setting. Now, you, if you can look at it, this has a mo uh, lots of different features to it. Uh, delay times, uh, sensitivities for the emotion sensors, uh, your dim levels. So it's similar to uh, what we just talked about uh, for different applications that if you have a uh, 10 p.m. schedule, uh, you want to dim down the light to a certain percentage. And if it detects motion, it pumps up to 100%. And then it fades out in 30 minutes or so uh, after the delay time, it, when it goes back to uh, the initial uh, dimming level. So this is similar to the uh, overall control system. Uh, and we want to make sure it has a varieties of the control features that can uh, fit for different application. Now, uh, wall switch is the same thing uh, as the lights. You want to add the wall switch first. They will detect uh, the wall switches by itself. If you click the button, um, once it finds it, uh, it will add them automatically with a little code um, so that you can kind of uh, put this uh, switch into a certain group uh, that controls certain portion of light or individual lights. Now uh, you want to set up, as, you can set up as many groups as you want uh, for kind of very complicated uh, control. Uh, so, but uh, there's no limit for the, 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 for the way that how you want to set it up. It's really totally up to the customer and they can just play with that and change whenever they need to. 
Um, so this is a nice way to do it. So they don't have to scan anything uh, when the contractor is installing the fixture, the end user, the, the owner of the facility, uh, they can actually come back in later after the contractor has installed the fixture. And then they can just do it all by themselves without any contractors involved. Okay. Um, is the video playing? Oh, okay. So now you can obviously, uh, this is a full offer uh, for any indoor space. So if you have a, um, if a customer have a space like what we have in Houston now, so we have a office space, right? And then we have a warehouse, we have a storage warehouse and we have the modification area. So technically speaking, we have a three zone setup over here in Houston. Um, the way that we did it is actually uh, to separate these three zones. So you have, we have this um, uh, between the aisles highway for the main uh, storage. Uh, so we, we link these things with the motion sensors and I kind of control that as a one zone. And then we have people in the offices so we control the traffic panels in the office. And then we control the modification zone. Now modification typically because they need more lights so we don't dim them down as much as we do in the office or the storage area. So this is the, uh, the, the reason that why you wanna create different zones or different scenes to kind of fit every uh, section of your facility. So this is, makes it a, a full offer for uh, any indoor application. I think we can uh, fast forward a little bit. We just keep dimming the fixtures and all that, so. So what we're doing here is to create a scene for the groups, right? So if when you are setting up the groups, you're basically grouping the fixtures. Now you want the fixtures to act in a certain behavior. This is how you do it by uh, set up the scene for these groups. Um, so, so when you are setting up the scenes, now you want what you want to do. Obviously, a lot of times you want to set up a time that when the dimming starts, uh, maybe it's after hour, and then uh, you want to set a schedule when the lights come back to uh, a normal uh, light level. Uh, now you can set up the maximum light level as the Synapse system. It works similar to that, um, but it's a lot of setting. Uh, it's fairly easy to do, as you can see on this, it's just a bunch of buttons that they need you to be playing around with them. Uh, typically, we will recommend, uh, can you pause right here? Mm -hmm. uh, so typically, we recommend that the, the customer would just do uh, name all these fixtures just like the snap system so that they're not confused which lights which uh, because that when we're setting up the lights these are just going default not the names of the fixture right so uh, we recommend what they do is that because these sections are probably going to be wired in different circuits so we recommend they turn on individual circuits and then add the fixtures and then uh, turn them off and then turn on this next section they want to do and then add them so that they're not mix and matching all these fixtures. Now, it's very easy to identify which fixtures which so that it can easily move this around if they misplace some fixtures in a different zone or something, so. Um, now, a lot of people are gonna ask about the, uh, how they gonna have this uh, control access towards this whole uh, control mesh network setup. So typically, we recommend that the owner of the company or the owner for facility um, will hold this uh, an administrator uh, QR code. This allows them to have a full access of uh, everything within the control system. Now, obviously the owner is not gonna be in all the time. So if whenever there's no access to his phone, what he can do is he can share this code mm -hmm. to a office manager. The office manager it's basically gonna use as a user QR code. So it's a user, 
basically level of the uh, control. Now what they can do is they cannot change the setting. They cannot add or delete fixtures. But what they can do is they can access to the control features of these fixtures. They can turn them on and off. They can dim them. They can change the times and all that stuff. But they cannot change the fixture itself. So that way it prevents that people are playing around with all these fixtures and somehow they messed up and it's not working properly. So this way it also kind of prevents that if you have an employee that, ho uh, that holds the uh, daily access of the lighting control in your facility, but some, uh, for, for some reason he or she quit or something like that or having a vacation, there's no access to the control. So that we actually recommend the uh, administrator uh, QR code holder will issue a few of these user uh, QR code to their employees. So make sure that always somebody is going to be there with access to this control system. Now, uh, people is going to be uh, not just satisfied with only accessing to their controls and by just using the phone. So that's why we have the wall switch to go with, along with that to kind of make sure that we have different ways to access into the control system. Uh, can you go back to the uh, PowerPoint, please? Yes, one second. Sure. Cool. Michael, we do have a few questions. So the first question about the Kielton system is what is the linkage setting? Uh, I'm sorry, what, what was that again? In the Kielton system, what is the linkage setting that shows under groups? Basically, it, it basically tells you that um, uh, which fixtures is within that group, and then you can kind of change the linkage between each of the fixtures. So it is a feature that you can kind of uh, go deep within one group and then uh, kind of just change the, uh, the way that this group functions. Basically, if you have multiple fixtures within that group, um, within that group. So now what you want to do is you want to have this group to link with another group or it has a, um, Oh, no reference in the instructions. Okay, we probably need to update the uh, instruction on the uh, on the control system on, for that one. But uh, basically, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, you don't have to go that deep to kind of set it up the, the way it does. Uh, what it does is kind of have a smarter way to figure out what fixtures talk to another fixture, um, so that you have a better communication between each fixtures to form a better, uh, better mesh, uh, mesh group within, uh, within a certain group A or certain group B, so. Okay, great. And then another question is, is there any problem if there is a power outage? When power comes back on, is everything still working the way it was programmed? Uh, yes, it has a memory setting within the power pack, so it won't be effective when you just turn on and off of the power or just cut the power entirely of the fixture. Um, so, uh, basically, actually, as a, as a safety uh, thing to our control. Now, when you set it up the control, right, you already have the, 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 the way that you want it. It won't change unless you physically go up there and reset the power pad. Now, the way that reset the power pad is actually a little bit complicated. You need to turn the fixture on and off a few times in a different frequencies. Uh, this is all going to be included in the uh, instruct, uh, instruction. So this way that we make sure that the program did it group or stuff like the setting won't be changed that easily. So you want to make sure you set it up the right way the first time. And then, uh, you know, if you need, really need to make some changes, uh, it's not going to be uh, that easy. So it's not going to have any problems with that. Another question, can you assign user access to just one zone? Uh, I believe so, yes. So uh, the, 
the, uh, I believe when you are doing this thing, you are uh, authorizing a user QR code and then you can assign this user QR code's uh, authorization level uh, to different uh, groups um, or in your term zone. So I think this that's doable, yes. Great. Um, and then one more question. Since this system is controlled by a phone, is it possible for someone that isn't in a facility to turn the lights on and off and potentially change group settings? Uh, no, you want to be uh, within the uh, range of the Bluetooth uh, network. So this is not a cloud based. Uh, this is a Bluetooth base. You want to be, you have to be within the, that. So that's why I was mentioning that you, as a, as the owner of the facility, you want to make sure there's a few people in the company that has access or at least a user access to your lighting system. Otherwise that if you have a office manager that is on vacation or something, uh, they, they won't be able to control their lighting or a uh, simple way to do it is just to buy a, cheap uh, tablet, like $150 or something, and then just put it there at the office for the lighting control if they don't wanna go with the wall switch option. Um, also, I would like to add on the uh, the uh, linkage thing that uh, some of you guys asked already, and I think you guys probably are gonna be a little confused about it. So again, the thing is more for uh, a more comprehensive setting. Now this thing basically tells the way how these fixtures gonna communicate with each other within the same zone. Now uh, to a more practical application, uh, if you have sensors on these different fixtures, right? This linkage thing is, if you can imagine, this can help you to maximize your sensor capability within a certain zone. You don't have to have one motion sensors per fixture if you do the linkage. So, which means that if you can do, if you have a AB3 uh, fixtures in one zone, Okay, and then a fixture has this uh, motion sensor, right? And then this linkage will be allow you to actually set up the way that a fixture will tell B fixture what to do when a fixture is doing something because of the motion detection, right? So this way kind of enhance the overall communication between the, uh, the group. Now, typically we will recommend to add uh, sensors to every fixture because these are inexpensive. Number one, number two is it provides a better uh, overall coverage because if you only have one motion sensor, you might not have a full coverage of the entryway or something. So you wanna have multiple ones to have overlap coverage in a warehouse. And, uh, but if there's a tiny small job, they just don't wanna do that way. Uh, we can use this linkage to kind of maximize the control capability within a certain group. So I hope that answers your question. Um, do we have more or? Uh, yes, we do have one more question, Michael. Can you right. qualify the maximum mounting height of the PR PIR 50 feet or 100 feet, what is the max mounting height? Well, so the small one without the daylight harvesting the bottom motion sensor that you just saw the picture, that's 20 feet max mounting height. So that's what I said is more like a low bay type of stuff, more for offices. Uh, you know, it's not really for a high ceiling warehouse. So 20 feet maximum mounting height, it has a 40 feet diameter motion detect uh, coverage. Uh, on the other hand, the larger one, which is the PRIs with the data harvesting uh, integrated. Now the data harvesting can be uh, uh, turned off if you need to, uh, that's a, a, a option. So you don't have to do data harvesting if you don't want it to. Uh, the maximum mounting height is a 50 feet and it's a 100 feet diameter uh, motion detect 
uh, coverage. So that's more for a high bay where you have a 35, 40 foot ceiling, uh, a high rise or a warehouse or something. So. Uh, there's a question from Dale uh, regarding the uh, support. Uh, what we're expecting is that after the initial installation and setup, if they have uh, uh, simple questions that they'll be able to call us and we'll be able to work with them. Um, Michael will set up some kind of uh, uh, option for extended support or uh, if they change their mind about the configuration a year after the sale, uh, but initially, I think the uh, uh, any problem that they have, initially they'll be able to contact us no no problem, and uh, for free and uh, simple questions after the fact that we'll be able to help them with anything where something's simply not working. Well, that's obviously going to be supported uh, uh, because of the warranty that is from Snaps, uh, which I believe another person had asked about. Uh, but. Uh, if they're having a problem figuring out how to do something, if it's something simple, we'll definitely be able to do it for them. If it's something that's gonna take 10 hours of our time, Michael may want to have some type of uh, uh, support option where it's paid, uh, but I don't, I don't see too many situations like that. Uh, in regards to the warranty question also, it is a five-year warranty on the device, but they've been selling these systems for almost 20 years now, uh, different versions of it and they're still updating the software on 20 year old versions. So they will continue offering software updates for the gateways and devices as long as uh, they support those. So they don't know at what point they're gonna cut off support on a 20 year old device, but eventually they will. But uh, for the moment they have devices going back 20 years that they're still updating software and firmware on. Mm -hmm. And Michael, another question, what do you view as a, as potential customer objections to using the Keelton Bluetooth offering? Well, basically, uh, a, the, I would say the main application for this indoor, uh, again, indoor wireless control system will be uh, some people like us, right? So SLG currently has a office, has a modification has the warehouse, right? So this is the type of application that people will want to have a affordable indoor only. Uh, they don't need a huge amount of features. They just need to be able to dim them, schedule them, control them in a very basic level. Uh, that's something uh, Kilton will have a very nice coverage for. So uh, for example, our facility, we don't, we don't have access to the uh, area lighting at the parking lot or loading dock, right? So these, those are uh, separate for the landlords. We only control the high base in the warehouse, the strip lighting that we use in the modification area, the travers and panels we use in the office. So this is the perfect uh, application for us to use a Carlton system. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Synapse, you can look at this is uh, the features benefit between a, like a comparison between our two different solutions here. Uh, if you look at the Synapse, it is more expensive, absolutely, but it's more powerful. It has a lot more features. It's outdoor rated. Uh, that means if you have a large facility, for example, a car dealership, when they want to control the parking lot, the showroom, the uh, parking garage for their inventory, uh, all in one system, Synapse is definitely the way to go because it can integrate within the indoor and outdoor space just under one system, okay? And it does have a better coverage, uh, a longer distance between fixtures. So, so definitely for a larger space, uh, the more expensive, more powerful Synapse system will be the solution for it. But uh, Kiloton on the other hand is for something basic, a budget friendly, uh, they want to only achieve some, uh, a basic control functionality for their facility. Uh, Kiloton is the way to go. So, uh, Additionally there on the Synapse, if they're wanting to do more than just control the lights, if they're wanting to monitor them, uh, I think I'd mentioned before that uh, if you have the correct kind of uh, power supply, uh, then you can monitor the, the power usage of the light. You can monitor the temperature of the power supply, things like that. 
There are some customers that are using these that they're able to detect fluctuations in the power for uh, uh, street lights and that they can tell that's what's causing the lights to burn out. Um, and also Synapse has other types of control systems that are used at things like uh, chemical plants uh, for uh, controlling uh, uh, power and HVAC and monitoring fluid and things. And for a large customer that's wanting some type of total solution, uh, they have a solution where it can tie all that in together or it has what's called an API where information can come into the system or go out of the system so it can communicate with another control system. Um, so basically, uh, we already mentioned this, but um, uh, the idea here that we want to share with you guys is that whenever you have a control op uh, opportunity, please do talk to us. Uh, either one of these solutions will be able to cover and uh, we can actually provide a nice solution for uh, any application so far that we've, we're not seeing much of a limitation at this moment. So uh, whenever you have opportunity, do talk to us. We can work on a case-by-case -case basis. It is a fairly new thing for us and obviously for you guys as well. So uh, we wanted to take on this thing on a case-by-case -case basis and then kind of just paired it up with our fixture offering, right? So the commissioning is, uh, is one of the things that we want to offer is whenever they are having a uh, hesitation uh, when they're touching the controls, they think this is co too complicated, the contractor doesn't know how to do it, and they don't want to get involved in all this uh, technical stuff. Uh, we are offering full support, either it's remote or physically be there for a larger opportunities. Um, just kind of walk them through uh, your originals gonna be uh, very supportive for you guys on this particular uh, uh, topic. So whenever you have something, talk to them, they will be able to kind of uh, work with you to provide a solution with the fixtures that we offer. Uh, the other thing is that we are trying to promote the, uh, we are trying to promote the education uh, application at this, at this moment for a lot of schools because uh, a lot of decisions are actually being made uh, during this time. So uh, and all, uh, a lot of schools actually want to have some sort of control system because they have multiple classrooms or conference rooms or uh, they want to have uh, uh, a full control to kind of minimize the electric bill, uh, energy consumption. Uh, schools is definitely a very nice uh, application for either the, of this control system because they have so many different sections within that facility, different classrooms, right, uh, a cafeteria, they all need different kinds of uh, uh, schedule or uh, control. So we are currently offering uh, for uh, schools and uh, uh, on this uh, Bluetooth control system, we wanted to provide a free demo uh, uh, samples to the con uh, to the schools along with our fixtures. Now we uh, this is maxed to uh, 10 Bluetooth power pad, which controls 10 fixtures. Uh, that's pretty much going to cover uh, a single classroom, and then we're going to uh, also provide them with a free uh, wall switch. So this is a free demo promotion that we're currently doing for uh, school application. Uh, based on our uh, Bluetooth control network offer. So, <clears throat> I think there were uh, <clears throat> two questions. Uh, one uh, from Rick uh, asking about uh, uh, DLC. The uh, Synapse Wireless is DLC certified. Uh, it's qualified for any rebates or uh, uh, any DLC uh, requirements by any local authority. Uh, and uh, for the uh, FAO, the field adjustable output, if you're talking about being able to control the light uh, from somewhere out in the field, uh, there are the options of the uh, switches. The switches are powered switches for the uh, snaps, which means uh, they look kind of like a standard push button wall switch. Uh, one of them's a two button, one of them's an eight button. Those buttons are assigned to uh, seams. And uh, those uh, uh, that that switch can be mounted inside of a uh, sealed box. 
uh, anywhere in the field, as long as it's within a couple of hundred feet of a light, it uses that same 2.4 gigahertz network to communicate with the lights. Um, so basically it can be installed anywhere that you're gonna have a power source. Uh, I'm not certain about the Bluetooth, Mike, Michael might be able to answer that. Uh, so Bluetooth, I think is not like this uh, Synap, so it's not fully qualified for any rebate. I'm not gonna say that because uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not, but uh, we, uh, we probably need to check on uh, case by case basis for the uh, utility company that you're gonna, uh, uh, that offers rebate for it. Uh, so be it's basically because the Bluetooth mesh network base control system is not being recognized that uh, some of the utilities, the DLC rebates, that's as far as I know, so. Uh, to talk about FAO. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Jim, the, uh, well, the FAO is, uh, is different than the, 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 the control system that uh, we, we just talked about here. So it's, a, it's, it's something different. So HAO is a little device that hooks up to the uh, zero to 10 dimming of our driver. And then that thing basically just kind of provides a uh, solution that adjusts the wattage of the driver uh, to kind of control the lumen output of the fixtures uh, at the at job site. So it it cannot be controlled uh, wirelessly. It had this a little trim pod thing that you need to twist them uh, with, uh, within the driver uh, compartment. So this is not a wireless control, if you put it that way. This is more just for adjusting the wattages to kind of meet some of the DLC rebates at certain location. Uh, for example, we did uh, a job, uh, I believe it was, it was in Ohio, uh, that um, uh, we offered the FAO solution for some of the wall packs that we're doing simply because uh, they needed to be at a 17 watt instead of a, uh, a higher wattage to uh, actually obtain the rebate. Uh, so we offered it the smaller uh, uh, wall packs that we have, the 45 watt uh, wall pack, and then we use the FAO solution to kind of uh, dim it down to, uh, I mean, adjust it down to uh, 22 watt to kind of fit the uh, rebate requ uh, requirement. So, but that cannot be changed uh, remotely. It has to physically turn the train pie using a screwdriver or something. So. Also, I just want to add that for all of the participants that joined in today's webinar, we do have a mystery gift for everyone. And so if you um, want to send an email to marketing at slgus.com with your residential address, we will ship you this mystery gift free of charge. Um, or if you want to send a private message to the panelists, I can also get your contact information from there. Cool. Uh, so is that because I'm having a little lag here of all these questions. So Hannah, do we have more? Um, that's all I see now in our Q&A, but feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions you just want to ask Michael directly. Oh, okay. Now I see this. Yeah, I'm having a lag of the, <laughs> the, the questions on the board for some reason. But um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that's not a, 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 a I, I wouldn't call it a control gym, to be honest with you. Uh, it's more just a, a way that we tweak the driver. Uh, as a matter of fact, there yeah, guys, we have actually two ways to tweak the driver. One is with the FAO uh, device, which is so separately, uh, just saying. And the other one is we have a software uh, in Houston uh, at a modification area that we have, uh, we can actually tweak the driver using that way as well. No, can you hear me? Uh, yes. 
Oh, okay, I, yeah, I unmuted. The only reason I brought it up is because hardly anybody seems to know about it. Right, so yes, because we uh, several times. Well, absolutely, you're right. We didn't put it on the uh, the spec sheet or any cut sheet or any price sheet on uh, for the FAO uh, thing that we offer. Uh, I think this is more, uh, in Michael Wood's perspective, this is more at a trial period. Uh, so he's not entirely ready to kind of have this thing online, uh, like fully online. But uh, we do have this solution. We used to just do tweak the driver using a software uh, that it, it kind of just say, uh, we hooked up the, the driver at a computer uh, in uh, our warehouse and then we uh, kind of adjust the current uh, of the driver. Uh, that way we uh, achieve the, the uh, yeah. yeah, we achieve the, the, the yeah, wattage adjustable thing, so. Yeah, we've had a number of applications where we were trying to meet a spec and we were over, over delivering lumens and that came in kind of handy and it's a very inexpensive, quick, easy way to, uh, to address it absolutely it is a nice solution for it so but uh i think uh i think michael was working on that to have it uh available uh, across the board uh but uh, there's some i think there's some uh slight difficulties or how they want to price it out how they want to position it uh, in the market uh i don't think that i don't know if they, he wants to call it a fao because uh some of the major manif uh lighting companies a tier ones they're uh, using the name. So we might want to change the name as well, uh, but uh, it should be coming pretty soon. So uh, it's just a nice little device associated with our fixture. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but yeah, I actually liked it. It was, it, was a, it was a nice solution for some smaller jobs and stuff. <clears throat> well, thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Jim. So, uh, any more question, guys? Uh, if not, uh, well, thank you for joining us, and uh, uh, please do reach out to your regional, uh, you know, down the road if you have, you know, opportunities or questions about our control.